uh, Daisy Olson here, Justin Tadlock, and we're talking about block theme features coming to uh, WordPress 6.1 in a few weeks. And uh, Justin was just sharing about how how block theming is allowing him to do things that previously maybe were just a, like on his wish list. So um, super cool. Yeah, you uh, kind of got cut off mid ramble there. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I, I think uh, block based templates and uh, classic themes are like or the like that's the we're at the transitioning point now, like like people can really, uh, theme authors can really start uh, just, uh, it, especially if you have like an existing user base, uh, you know, maybe you got 10,000 users, you don't want to just like suddenly turn your uh, uh, classic theme into a full fledged uh, block theme. And like, you can just start like with specific sections at one time, like say, uh, like just a really like low hanging fruit is like uh, the four or four page content. Um, you can't edit that traditionally without diving into, uh, you know, a PHP file. So like just drop in like a, you know, block template part, let, you know, users edit that content and it's something they're likely not to like screw up the whole site with. Um, like just introducing that one thing um, and then just start like, you know, picking up more advanced thing, uh, things like, uh, you know, switching out your header, uh, you know, footer, sidebars. Uh, I actually like using this system for sidebars more so than I do the, uh, like, the kind of implementation we have with block sidebar, which block widgets now. Um, so I think there's a lot I, of... I think I yeah, agree with you on that. A lot of awesome things to do uh, there. Um I don't know how much I'll explore just because I'm like fully on board, you know, 100% block themes now. Um, but I'd love to see like what our community does with it. Has anyone here tried any of these? Um, like taking one of these um, block template parts and putting it into a classic theme? No. So this kind of reminds me a little bit. So way if we go way back to ancient history, um, when I first started using WordPress, widgets were actually a plugin. So mm -hmm. there really weren't very many themes out there. And um, uh, <laughs> that uh, would, I'm sorry, the, there weren't that many themes out there that, that uh, used widgets at the time. So it was a very popular plugin. Mm -hmm. huge amount of of support behind it and it wasn't too long before it, it rolled into core but the other the other time in our history and this is kind of interesting because i know there's there's some work being done to kind of replace this old old menu system when you would be looking to insert a, a new menu part of the new menu navigation um system back in 2010 i think it was and at that point we were you know, moving from all of the themes just had to build their own navigation into like a centralized, here we have a way to build navigation from within WordPress. And now we're moving even further down the road to saying, okay, well, we can build these content areas that are going to maybe be used in more than one place on a site, kind of like a widget area. And now we can um, use them or build them similar to the way we would build with the block editor. Oh yeah, I still remember the widgets plugin too. That was like version two point or two point two, somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, really. Uh, so Lisa says uh, she has uh, made a hybrid theme. Uh, Very so, cool. So far, um, yeah. And I, I kind of hate that the word hybrid because that was my old business, like my first theme, and I'm still like subscribed to every like the hybrid word um, on WordPress. So like I get just get random emails now. Uh, I need to shut that off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I bet you do. <laughs> um. uh, all right. And um, Sally says um, that she just made her first full site editing theme, but haven't tried the hybrid model. I'm, I'm curious to try it too. I'll have to go find an old theme somewhere and just play with it. Um, I'll really everything that's in this field guide related to themes. I just want to poke at 
<laughs> and yeah. give it a good run. Um, make sure that I understand what it really does and how it's going to help people so that I can uh, continue to try to share that word. Yeah. Can I I'll... chime in real quick with something? Sure thing. Um, one thing I've noticed that I like to call, and I know this is for theme developers, but if you're in like an agency land, I know that's one of the things that people have been really excited about um, from the outreach program is being able to use block temple parts um, in an agency setting. So maybe you had a bunch of requests where someone wants control over the footer or the header, um, you can provide that. And there's also a ton of just locking APIs and different ways you can curate the experience along with these block template parts that I think when combined um, will be really cool. Obviously that's probably more in like an agency environment where you're working like one-to-one -one with someone rather than rolling it out to everyone. But I think it's neat to see how these things can combine. Yeah, yeah for that's sure. good feedback. Uh, I will say like the, uh, like I've done a lot of it experimenting with this like a couple of weeks ago. So like the biggest issue I've ran into with uh, uh, the block template parts is like just uh, CSS issues. Like if um, you just like I, I went like full like full out and like wanted to put a hero header in uh, 2021, I think. Um, and so like it wasn't built. It wasn't built like uh, in terms uh, like to handle blocks in the like template uh, out, outside of the content area. So like, you know, I was having to overwrite like old CSS. Um, and I think that's just going to be individual themes. Like it's going to, there's a little bit of a hump you're going to have to get over uh, if you're like plugging in into an old project. Um, but not to make it sound like, uh, you know, just a uh, walk in the park doing, you know, just plugging in a template and being done with it. There's some work involved with it, but I think it's worth it. Yeah. That I, th that one of the things that Ann mentioned about um, locking content kind of mm -hmm. leads us into another item that's in the field guide, which might, I think it's going to probably uh, relate more to um, people building custom post types, but there are some content locking features coming that, uh, so it, previously we were able to lock down like moving and removing blocks um, when we added them to templates, but now we'll be able to lock down um, more specifically down to just the content of a block. So things like media URLs and the actual content, maybe like of a paragraph block or something like that. And, and everything else gets locked down around it. So if you're creating for a client or for a really custom, um, very specific thing, and you need everything to like really stay where it is, <laughs> the design, the, 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 where the blocks are and, and all of that, then being able to make it so that the only thing that the end user, the, the uh, content creator is going to edit are the things that are relevant to them. So I think that is going to be really interesting for things that are maybe using more creative use of post types, for example, or um, things like that. So in, in the dev note, it talks about um, example with a custom post type template that would be um, registered yeah. as a starting point for a post. Yeah, in my mind, like I'm thinking about the uh, like the content only editing, uh, like when you lock that um, is the ability to create like uh, like a whole set of patterns that can can keep the a consistent design experience like uh, throughout the throughout the theme and like users can, users can just plug in their uh, contents. Um, and, you know, maybe they, ch uh, instead of changing into the uh, design on individual blocks, they kind of head to the side editor and change like the global styles. Uh, so they're not, um, like say if you do a pricing table on, you know, your front page and you decide to change the colors from blue to orange, um, that's where like, and then you have a different pricing table and you forgot to change the colors. You, you kind of want that same consistency, uh, like branding across the site. Um, so like, when theme authors can like present like these pack uh, packages of different uh, designs, uh, uh, usually like along with patterns and lock down uh, the design editing. So the users only edit the content um, and that just kind of forces them over to the global styles to make the changes. Um, yeah. Cause that's been like uh, a pain point for a lot of people. Uh, theme authors like, 
um because like you know you might have a user use a you know a certain pattern like a hundred times and then all of a sudden they want to change their site design but as everything's tied back to you know any changes they made um, before sure. yeah yeah so thinking back to some experiences that i had uh working on client sites you would come across a a template or or a post type maybe where the content area had been removed entirely and all you had was a list of fields to complete um, <laughs> that were going to populate the front end, but you had no idea what that was going to look like uh, except experience of having done it before. So, or even worse is you leave the content area, but you don't use it <laughs> and you got to <laughs> scroll down to see where you're actually going to be adding your content. I think that that this way of like building out a, kind of like a it's like a hybrid of somewhere between a WYSIWYG and um I don't know an actual functional way to edit content and it's never going to be quite what you see on the front end but um but I think that that's just the nature of having something that can be changed you know it's never going to be it's you've got to be able to have a way to interact with things so all right so what else do you think looks interesting from the list, Justin? Is there something else that you think we could jump over to? Does okay, anyone yeah, have I'm any gonna... questions? If you feel like there's yeah. something that you've seen or you've heard about that you'd like to chat about, um, call it out. This is not just me and Justin talking necessarily. I'd love it if we get some some other voices in the mix. Um, your video will not show up if you talk. Um, I lock that so that it's just me and Justin but if you um, have your microphone uh, unmuted, go ahead and, and call out uh, something that you think is very cool that's coming or a question that you have about something that we've already talked about or something that you've heard about. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> then let's continue. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, this feels like a pretty small change, but it might uh, make it feel a little bit more consistent if you're working with a theme that uh, register, or I say register, register is not exactly the word. If, if a theme uses a navigation block in, usually it'll be empty if it's in a theme that's been distributed, um, then the, the fallback behavior of that is going to be changing just a little bit to make it more consistent between what you see on the back end and what you see on the front end when you first activate that theme. So that's the way I'm understanding it, at least. Yeah, uh, like previous versions, I think on the front end, uh, like if the navigation block uh, was just the default, mm -hmm. uh, then like when the user added it to their website, uh, it would just put out a page list on the front end. But on the in the editor, it would just be like you know pick a menu, um, so the the experience was different. Um, like I, I the only way I've really worked around that um, is I've just like put some like you know demo links in there uh, in the past, but like that shouldn't really shouldn't need to do that anymore. Um, so if anybody right, been, so if, yeah. if you're a theme developer, I would say, and you want to control that experience so that whenever that theme is activated. Um, you want to know that these items show, I think you can put like uh, yeah. placeholder items into your menu. Yeah. And there, template. there actually is a fallback hook too. Uh, I don't know if it works in the, on the front end and the editor though. Mm. Um, I'll have to test that. Um, mm. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like going back to the previous menu system and having to write custom walker functions to, make it work a little bit differently than the default right it's it's a lot easier to do that now yeah responding here uh oh yeah i don't even miss custom walkers at all <laughs> <laughs> that and comments too we had to use them a lot for comments yeah uh yeah i'm just typing in the uh <laughs> chat there um so um yeah that's just a minor thing uh i know one thing everybody's excited about is the fluid font sizes um yeah uh that's it's not well we could do fluid for you just had to do it on your own um so yeah. 
now there's uh you can uh tell wordpress to, to do it for you and and um, if you're curious about what that means basically it's you're you're setting a default font size um based on i think it's a 16 pixel base and then using rems to to determine the sizing and then you can set a max and a min size in rems and then as your browser grows and shrinks it will adjust the text size accordingly so um do we have there were some videos i think demonstrating this in the dev note maybe i can find one of those let me see uh yeah um yeah, i was trying to say i've had an example on this computer i don't think i do mm -hmm. at the moment uh well, I might have 20, uh, 2023 up somewhere. All right. Let me see if I can um, share share my screen. Let's see. Okay. All right. Can you all see that? Typesetting and printing workshops. I can't see yeah, the chat now. I, so. I'm good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and hit play on this. I don't think there's any audio. I think it's just a, a screen capture. So you can see as the, the display gets narrower, it changes the actual size of the text. So you think about like we've come so far with mobile responsivity and you remember when smartphones or or even worse feature phones first started to come out and we were suddenly trying to access the internet on them <laughs> and everything got like really really tiny as we tried to cram entire desktop websites into these small areas and now we're getting to a place where we can have you know infinite uh responsiveness it, so no matter what size the display is, it's going to be useful. It's going to be usable, readable, um, but not necessarily the same. So it's not like you're trying yeah. to create this specific pixel perfect uh, experience. You're trying to have a website that's usable by human beings. So, yeah, um, I had, um, yeah. Uh, actually, I think Michael actually is bringing it up in the chat uh, about if, if I can pull that up. Um. Yeah, bypassing media queries. Um, that's like kind of a good uh, thing to mention because we get a lot of uh, questions about like when are we going to get, you know, like some mobile, you know, mobile or tablet like design options on blocks, and but that's really not the direction like you know Core is taking. There's more of an uh, intrinsic design um, direction. So like we use things like Clamp. Uh, to handle the fluid typography um like you know so things are just you're not you don't have like you know dozens of media queries and your you know design i mean because uh there's new devices every year uh new you know screen sizes it's not the ideal way all there there's some situations it is uh, ideal to like base your design off with media queries but the more we can get away from that um, and just have things that are fluid and move along with whatever screen size uh, that that the user is viewing for, from, uh, that the better. Um, mm -hmm. And that takes some time. So I know like some people get a little frustrated without like what they've seen maybe over the past decade from like different design tools. Um, and, but I think uh, cores are going in the right direction with this. Um, it's a different way of thinking about how to deal with responsivity, I think. Yeah, sure. and the uh, the CSS is like much lighter in the end when you. <laughs> but kinda... harder to wrap your head around. I feel like yeah. if you if you're used to that idea of at this point I'm going to do this thing, <laughs> um, uh, it, it it takes a little bit more work to like figure out like the there's more math involved for sure. I mean, when you're talking oh, yeah. about clamp, you. Uh, you know, oh yeah, I have a I have like a SAS function for the, just to like automatically do that sort of thing from for me, so I don't I don't have to think about it. Um, yeah. If anybody needs that, uh, just like ping me on Slack or something. 
Well, um, now that we have fluid typography, you let we're yeah, but do you, math for you. <laughs> yeah, but we still have other areas like you know, like padding uh, margins um, that could use a similar treatment. Um, sure, and I I would imagine that we're going to get there at some point um, in some way. What it's actually going to look like, it's a little hard to say at the moment, but uh, because yeah. you know, with this trend towards um, fluidity. I think we'll see more and more getting built in, but I think the yeah. font sizes is a really good place to start. The one thing I would say, watch out with font sizes is like your line heights, make sure you're testing mm -hmm. those uh, as a designer. So you might want to throw in like some, like, you know, customization there with your line heights if you're not comfortable with them. Um, mm -hmm. I know some, like I get super picky about that. Um, so like, you know, you don't want like, you know, you know, 20 pixels of gap on your, like, you know, H1 heading element or something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, it can look pretty, pretty wonky there. <laughs> yeah. um, so there was a question about implementing custom designs and block themes. And oh, yeah, this is, this is such a, a thing that's really, you really have to understand how theme JSON works. Um, to figure out which things are going to become part of your site's defaults, your theme's defaults, uh, in terms of, of what CSS is going to be output through the block editor system, and then what you actually do need to create as custom CSS. And everything is kind of like a, it's, it's still in progress. You know, I'll, we're in the early days of block theming and we are going to keep finding new ways to improve on what we have. And one example that of something that we hadn't been able to do in theme.json that now we should be able to do would be um, setting some, some styles for like um, states of, of links, active, hover, um, and that wasn't something that we had an, a, a, the option to do. There's also some element um, styling that can be applied coming up. And the yeah, site was added. Uh, you can also do the uh, the state on the but on buttons too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna throw this link into the chat of the styling elements. Um, but that that's the direction we're going in. I don't know that you'll ever be able to do like we're not trying to necessarily recreate CSS <laughs> in in theme JSON, but the idea is that you're going to be able to create this these really efficient um, style sheets that are going to get better and better over time. So all right. yeah, and I always describe it as a common language between like WordPress, a theme, and like the user too, like. That's like what the theme JSON is. Um, mm, is I like that. Um, yeah, just a way for everybody to talk to each other. <laughs> uh, sure. Sorry, we had somebody coming in, or I had some feedback there anyway. Um, I heard something too. Um, I see Yakun. I don't know if I said your name right, but I see uh, your hand is raised. Did you have a question? Yeah, I got a couple questions. Um, I mean, this is a very basic question, but so like I can put text into a header block and select which header I want uh, using the block system and kind of in each post, so like header one, header two, header three. When I select each of these headers, there's kind of like a pre-formatted font size and style. Um, how do I like change the defaults for those? So you mean on a per template part basis? Um, or like for the entire theme, like it could be done through theme JSON. Uh, you can set uh, defaults. Um, yes, uh, like your styles. That uh, I think you, you can do it on end of like you can set some defaults for uh, all Hi, heading, Ryan. all headings. <laughs> and now I have something else coming through. Uh, uh, you can set the uh, defaults uh, for all headings. Uh, that's also in WordPress six point one. So it's like styles dot uh, styles dot element dot heading. Uh, and then you can also like go break that down to individual uh, headings like uh, styles that elements that uh, h1 you know that h2 um, mm -hmm. so what I found 
at least at this stage. So I, I'm coming at it from a little bit different perspective. Okay. And I found that when I, if I had a specific template or template part that I wanted to style differently, then um, I would make those styles at the block level in the templates and not try to put them into theme JSON. But I, I think that we'll probably get to a place just like we're now going to be able to do more um, styling from theme.json on a more gra granular level. Um, you might also be able to target a specific template part with certain styles. I am going to mute everyone for just a second and then um, you can unmute yourself again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Justin, you'll have to un unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> um, so, I don't know. I think that we'll see more and more, but I found that sometimes there are ways to use ThemeJSON to style something just by thinking about the nesting in, a, in like a more creative way. I think that one thing that would be really cool would be um, for a lot more code examples. I don't know where they're going to come from necessarily. Some of us are going to have to go make some, but just to create a um, theme JSON recipes <laughs> or, or cookbook, you know, that's going to show us lots of examples of how we can um, structure our styles so that they are they're giving us the results that we're looking for. It's it's you know we're all very probably a lot of us are accustomed to how to work with CSS, and this is a different paradigm. We're it's a different way of thinking because we're trying to apply our styles to controls that are in the block editor. Can I ask a quick follow-up to that? Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess in general, I'm a little bit unclear on the systems of like overrides because, uh, you know, there's like multiple levels with which you can program a theme and I'm not sure like which one WordPress checks first. Like back then when they had before the, uh, site full site editing they had like the uh, additional css uh menu where you can kind of like type additional css i didn't know if that applied globally or on a per page basis so i don't know anything you can speak to in terms of like the override hierarchy for any like style changes that you make whether it's by css or json um it, it's gonna cascade just like any other css yeah so it's based on there... what order everything loads in yeah, there's a lot, a lot of levels to that now. Uh, so you have WordPress, like default block styles uh, that are like at the very lowest. And then like, then you have, uh, you know, theme.json styles, I think would kind of come in next and then even user overrides. And then you got per block uh, styles that come in. Um, and somewhere in the middle of that too, you can also have like uh, style sheets attached to the blocks uh, too. Uh, as a theme author um but basically at the like the very tail like the highest and the uh a level is like what happens on the individual block level um that's like that should be the uh, like final say so on how something looks um and i've seen somewhere i wish i could find it right now i don't yeah have that handy. is uh we actually need a good like hierarchy page uh for the docs we need to like yeah, there uh, are some posts in core in the make core, um, probably maybe even somewhere in docs where it talks about um, core styles and then theme styles and then user styles. And that that should be the hierarchy that first we pull it from core and then we then we pull from the theme and then we pull from user. So. Yeah. And and user styles are things that you do in full site editing, basically. It's a, it's the difference, the changes that you make from what the theme is pulling in. I think we may have covered that that question. Um you know, I I'm trying to catch up with questions in their chat now. Uh <laughs> they they tend to come in. Uh yeah, so I've I've seen a couple of mentions of Learn WordPress, and I, I do want to throw a little um, plug in there for the great work that the training team is doing on making um, self-paced learning opportunities to learn all kinds of things about WordPress, not just development, but also just how to use it, how to build block themes, how to build blocks, 
um, lots and they're working on doing more and more. And this actually is um, kind of kind of part of that is we, you know, it's it, we publish it as a workshop and that's probably how a lot of you uh, registered that was through the learn WordPress meetup.com group. Okay, yeah, those are some good links uh, from Michael in the chat or uh, for everybody else. Uh, and Lisa's got one too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, were there other specific topics or uh, like we wanted to make sure to cover? I know we had some other questions like, that came in with the RSVP. Yeah, let me see if we have anything yeah. I can pull out of there. Yeah. Um, oh, Just Sally asked about... Um, First attempt as as uh, using fonts in theme JSON didn't work. I mean uh, that's a very specific question, <laughs> so it would be like a. I think we're going to have to see your code to answer that. But um, I think I that would, yeah, I would that, just kind of interject for just a second. We yeah, actually have a uh, a course coming up that's going to have a whole section on fonts. Uh, I actually yeah. just wrote it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I went to a, a learn session on fonts and it looked, you know, beautifully easy to set it up. You just put the font families, you know, you put the fonts in the folder, you put the font uh, family info in your theme JSON and, uh, it, you know, presto change, oh, it loads your custom fonts. And, and when I tried to actually do it, it was not working. Uh, uh, it, but uh, uh, so I, I still had to you know, and cue the fonts. Um, so I, I'm sure I, it will uh, improve with practice. And and also it's just yeah. possible that some of the, uh, uh, some of those features were not in whatever I happened to have active at the time. Yeah, I, I actually like completely done the same. Like it, it didn't work for me the very first time I did, did it. Um, I think so I actually had that happen to me too when I, I was prepping for WordCamp US and it took me a couple tries. I don't remember what I changed though. <laughs> so, um, but something changed and then it worked. But yeah, like I'll be happy to like, if you're like so having issues, um, like I'll be happy to like just to walk you like through it, uh, like one on one or um, because that's a can be a bit of a enough process because it's not just like the uh, like loading font faces, you also have to attach it to a, a font family. And then uh, actually use it somewhere after that. Um, yeah, uh, did, a... did that, but uh, for for some reason it uh, it it yeah. wasn't working until I you know added something in the functions file and then it behaved itself. Yeah, it's it, 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 yeah. I I still look up uh, even though I'm like writing one lesson on it. Like I'm still looking up and like just copy and pasting from like things I've already got working. Um, yeah. Hey, that's the trick to being a great developer is copy and pasting, by the way. I absolutely agree. Google, Reddit, Stack Overflow, the codex <laughs> that still shows up in the Google search. <laughs> yeah, all that. So um, here's another interesting thing. There was a question about tools for development. Um, there was an example of comp Composer, but I wanted to throw out a couple of things that I think can be really helpful for um from for the block theme development specifically. And one is um, if you are using theme JSON, make sure that you include the schema um, definition in your file because it's gonna and use a IDE that supports um, schema autocomplete. It will revolutionize wow. your ability to write these files because it will give you mm -hmm. lots of little hints about um one what is available in any given space but also will auto complete some of it for you with the default so then you know what to change it to <laughs> so i i think that that is such a great thing that some of the developers have taken on to make sure that we have a good schema and if you if you use the one that has trunk in the in the in the url that's the that's meant to work with the Gutenberg plugin, but there's another version of it that's specific to the WordPress version. So you want to make sure that you're using the one that's that's right for your installation of WordPress. So yeah, um, that's changed. That's just completely changed how I've right I like interacted with theme JSON now. Like just moving to VS Code and like uh, you know putting in the schema. Um, mm -hmm. Like it's kind of easy now. It feel, yeah, feels I have better. a text expander for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
so yeah and so michael um linked to a um to visual studio which is a microsoft software that's cross platform compatible and it's free and it's built on an open source base and it's one of several options that will just work with with schema out of the box so a lot of us have have started using visual studio for as an IDE, there's a there's a lot a huge community surrounding it. Lots of extensions to to make it work the way you want. I actually was working on building a whole Markdown notebook, um, like a personal knowledge management system that was all in VS Code. <laughs> I ended up moving a different direction, but it was really fun to go through that journey and see what kinds of things the developers in that open source community have have come up with. Um, kind of like our plugin and theme community in WordPress. Lots of stuff out there. Um, and then the other tool that I think is really helpful is there's a plugin in the WordPress uh, plugin directory called Create Block Theme. And that is a really helpful way to, um, it does a few different things, but one thing you can you can do is spin up a like a blank empty theme. That's a That's a functional block theme. It has just the basics in it. And then it gives you a, a starting point to build from. But the other thing it can do is it can take any changes that you say, make within the site editor and save them back to your theme at the file level. So it was a very cool tool um, to be able to start off with some basics. There are probably still things that you're going to have to do in the code, but to, to actually build a theme mostly from within WordPress is pretty neat. Yeah, I'm uh, just going to plug another like theme JSON related plugin. Uh, it's like uh, called Theme YAML. Uh, I tried it out like on a, earlier this year, I think. Uh, if you just prefer like, you know, not working in JSON, like you just want something that's a little oh, more yeah. uh, readable. Like, uh, I don't know. Like, they were, uh, it, it felt pretty neat to do it uh, and like just like, uh, like transfers the JSON for you. Um, and if you don't know what YAML is, it's um, it's basically a superset of JSON. So it's a different way of structuring your content in a yeah. still in a value or a key value pair sort of format, but without all of the brackets. <laughs> yeah. I would so. like to see that as uh, like a build script instead of like a plugin, though. Um, so there's probably something out there already. Um, Maybe. Just, yeah. I was just thinking the other day, I was not aware of this plugin, but I was just thinking the other day as I was working with some other non WordPress related things that, that use YAML. And I was like, wouldn't it be cool if I could write my theme JSON in YAML first? Because it is yeah. a lot easier to read. <laughs> yeah. And plus, you can like, like, it's easy to just leave comments, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, yeah. And theme JSONs are getting like kind of large, um, or they can be. I can't um, be. Yeah, if, I have a feeling that we're gonna have get get to a place where we need to break them out into smaller pieces. <laughs> so, mm. <laughs> but not today. Yeah, uh, I'm just trying to look over our list now. Uh, we've got fluid. Uh, I haven't touched. Uh, we haven't really touched on like the presets for padding, margin, and block gap. There's like uh, the spacing. I think that could be its uh, own. Or, yeah, own they're spacing. Talk, probably. Yeah, spacing presets. Uh, mm -hmm. You can basically set like a. You can like customize like every like spacing option um, instead of let, let, and then like turn off custom spacing for users. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> That's for the whole link there. Um, there, like, there's two different ways of doing it. There's like a whole like steps thing that was a little confusing to me, but uh, I just kind of like just made my individual like spacing sizes, um, like, and that uh, I think it's gonna be really useful for keeping uh, consistent spacing across your theme, um, and like just turn off like the custom stuff and like you know let the user ch you know choose size you know 100, 200, or whatever ever however they're naming them um uh you know so like uh you know you don't want a user like picking like this crazy big number uh 
and then like it not work, uh, you know, and then they kind of switch some things up and it not work. It, it just completely doesn't work with the next uh, design. Um, you know, like that, you know, 200 pixel gap, you know, and this one design might look good and then the next one, not so much. I think there's like some internal mapping there. Um, I haven't dove in into it as much as I wanted to um, in this cycle. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to be rambling about that. <laughs> and and we can move on to the next thing <laughs> if we I need to. What uh, is the next thing? Uh, I know we do have a few questions. Um, okay. And I don't, I haven't dove into the like reference styles yet. Um, and and theme and JSON, that's a whole another topic too. Yeah, it feels like, I don't know. I, I haven't really wrapped my head around it, but the idea that you can reference a style, we typically are referencing the variables that are created, mm -hmm. um, but to reference a style in another in another place within theme JSON is an interesting idea, and I don't I don't know that I fully understand what that's going to look like in practice. Yeah, I need a, a project before I can really talk about it. Um, but um, there's some stuff about filtering theme JSON data, which I think is going to probably affect plugins more than themes. That's my that's my hot take on it where as a plugin, you would be able to filter in your own theme JSON type content or t data. Yeah, there, data. yeah, yeah. PHP like filter hooks for, uh, you know, overriding, um, yeah, the theme JSON stuff. Uh, yeah, that's probably gonna apply mostly to plugins. Um, I think maybe there are some times when uh, there are probably some situations and themes where you might want to still like lean on like uh, a custom theme options page or something. Um, like, because, you know, like right now you, there's, you can't do like Google fonts through the font system or something. And maybe you want to like let a user like choose fonts in your theme and then like auto download them uh, to host them locally. And then you need to kind of hook back into a theme JSON to like overwrite the uh, font families or something, something like that. Um, there, you know, we'll just have to wait and see what, what people build with it. Yeah. Um, it'll be curious. I'm curious to see what the community does with all of these things. Honestly, it feels like yeah. there's a lot going on in here and none of them are like as earth shaking as like full site editing in general or the site editor or some of those really big things that we've had in some recent versions. But when you look at how many things are in this list, it's pretty pretty wild uh i see a question from lisa um, about block gap being confusing it is a little confusing the uh, main idea is it's the spacing between blocks so it doesn't put spacing before the first block or after the last block and it's being applied to inner blocks so you actually apply it to the uh -huh. container and then it gets applied to the next level in of blocks that's that's kind of like my oversimplification of it yeah uh yeah that's basically it. it's just like uh well in like the flow layouts it's a margin and like then there's the flex layouts where it's actually an actual like gap value um so that it makes it even more confusing like um because sometimes it's a gap sometimes it's a margin um yeah and i think that the the main idea behind it is to take the need to understand all of the technical details of it for the user to be able to say, oh, I just want this space to happen here. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, I don't know if that's really working in practice, but that's the main idea. But it is a pretty confusing, it is, it's caused a lot of conversation um, in the in the core channels as we try to sort out the best way to implement these ideas. But at its basic, it's it's how much space you're placing between blocks, whether they are going horizontally or vertically. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I like, uh, there's kind of an interesting question. I don't know how much, I uh, wonder how much it applies to themes, but uh, like this is from the RSVP list. Uh, is can query loops have conditional logic, such as uh, displaying only if the date has not passed? Um, 
And uh, there are actually new tools uh, for like hooking into, like creating your own uh, query block um, variation. variation. Yeah, variations now. Um, uh, that is in the field guide uh, too. Uh, but the way that we've done some of this up until now, I haven't used these any. I've done. I've not done anything with the new um, custom query loop block variations yet but one way that we've worked php into <laughs> our block themes kind of through the back door i would say almost although it was in a core theme so i guess it's it's canonical at that point um is to use block patterns that are hidden from the inserter <laughs> because <laughs> block patterns are registered with php <laughs> so we can't actually use conditionals in those yeah. in order to kind of get back some of our old temp our old way of thinking about how we do conditionals so um yeah block patterns are like uh anytime you need to do something the uh block editor isn't capable of yet just kind of stick it in the pattern and hide it away um you know some of the php stuff um and, and the revisit. reason yeah. that it works is because they're th first of all you can create a pattern register a pattern it's a PHP file. It's got some header information. Most of the file is just straight HTML blocks, but you wrap it up in whatever whatever old template tags you need to do what you need it to do, and then you um, register it as a as a false for the inserter, <laughs> so yeah. it's hidden. And then you use the pattern block in your template to pull it in. So it's kind of like this. It it's creative use case of um, things that already existed <laughs> just uh, a quick note on like doing conditionals and block patterns or with php is they're actually registered i think on the a net hook so like if you're really expecting early. like like some condition that happens later um that might not work um um, so as far as references for doing this, the best reference that I know of is to go look at the 2022 theme, because that's how some of the header is handled. Um, the bl bird block, I think mm -hmm. the birds in there, that section, it's, it's like, you kind of have to like break it down into pieces as you start to see how they actually constructed that header. Cause it's like a pattern within a pattern, within a block, within a template. <laughs> <laughs> so um that might not be the right order of things but that's that was kind of my feeling when I was looking through trying to reverse engineer what they did there but if you want to see a place where that um where that was done that is a that's a good place to go yeah I know we got a few minutes left uh like just on time wise so like I want to make sure like we're covering any questions anybody has um like I just want to make it like open up the floor a bit. Um, so Yakin yeah. says, um, doesn't it kind of defeat the purpose of WordPress if I need to know HTML and CSS to a professional degree or technical detail to do these basic customizations? I don't think that's the intention. Mm. I think that you were trying, WordPress is covering huge amounts of ground in terms of being able to, to meet the needs of, of, developers that are building enterprise level applications for huge clients and also um, your hobby blogger who just wants to have a website where they can talk about you know their crafting yeah I think it's it's covering all of that and <clears throat> so there are, you might not be able to do every single thing without some html and css experience but there's a lot you can do without very, without any or with very little. Yeah, I'll say like uh, I have a cousin, an older cousin. He's he's just not really technically savvy. So, um, but he wanted a website several years back. So, of course, you know, Justin, the WordPress developer in the family, gets to set it up for him. Um, and so like he had such trouble just doing basic what I would call basic things like adding a link or like bolding text in like classic editor. Um, and like uh, every week I would get a call, I messed something up. Um, but since then, I think like, uh, he, like since he's moved, I've moved him over to, uh, the block editor 
I've had far fewer of those questions. Um, so I don't really like this is an example of somebody who's just like not he doesn't know code, doesn't know HTML, doesn't CSS, nothing. Um, and like so you don't need that level of uh, expertise um, until you want to start getting into more, you know, advanced stuff. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, it's just different. Uh, you know, WordPress is covering a big, a large spectrum. Uh, Absolutely. All right. Do we have any other comments, questions before we wrap things up for today? So I'm sure that we have a pretty wide variety of people with different levels of usage here today. And I hope that everyone found something um, interesting or useful today. <laughs> uh, and we will we'll keep seeing what comes along and try to, to maybe do some deeper dives into some of these specific things it would be pretty cool. Yeah. And I didn't even have a cat show up like like once the meet like the whole thing got started like they missed I their saw chance. your cat uh, yeah it was it just it was here at the very beginning and like it you know that was it <laughs> uh, but yeah seriously i mean we're like i mean y'all got any questions uh i mean use it you know use whatever knowledge we might have um you can always find us in the make wordpress slack yeah um I'm at, at Green Shady, so not my. Yeah. And I am at Daisy O with the letter O. And I'll just type in the Slack in case anybody wants to. Uh, uh, like, like if you had a question about anything we talked about today, you know, don't mm -hmm. hesitate to, you know, just you know DM me or something. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you all for coming today, and. Um, let us know if you have any other questions or if you'd like to see another topic, we'll uh, see what we can do. So have a great one, everyone. All right. Bye. <laughs>